in a tent, Henry. While Henry does ultimately perish thanks to the FNAF 6 fire, he would have been a target for William beforehand, especially once he had learned who was actually committing the crimes at his restaurants. But why didn't William go after him? It would have been too obvious, really. I mean, there are five murders that occur inside the walls of the restaurant. They already suspect William for it. But then Henry goes missing and then William is left as the sole proprietor of the business? That's super suspicious and would definitely result in an arrest. Motive means an opportunity. Motive is absolutely there, especially if William was cheating with Henry's wife or something, means would be fairly easy to find and William has plenty of opportunities, let's be honest. So killing Henry would only result in William going to jail, which probably saved Henry's life. And at 9, Vanny. Vanny is an interesting case here, because while she is in a way a victim of glitch trap, she doesn't really know it, or at least is unable to communicate it, only being able to search help on the company computer. Not only that, but William could very well have killed Vanny, but he didn't, opting instead to gain partial control over her. So while she isn't a victim in the traditional sense, I'm sure that there are people who are willing to argue in the comments. So I'm going to make this simple. My list, my rules. Plus, this is a really hard list. There there aren't many people who don't end up dying in the FNAF universe, alright? So cut me some slack if a couple of these numbers are iffy to say the least. But Vanny has not yet suffered the ultimate fate of the Forever in Apps, so I'm allowing myself to say that she was almost a victim. Does that mean she isn't going to die? No, I feel like she almost certainly will perish, but she hasn't yet, and that's good enough for me. And it ain't Sammy Emily. Another one that kinda fits if you squint at it and then cough a couple of times. Sammy Emily was in the first two FNAF novels, Charlie's twin brother who was kidnapped and killed by William Afton. We as the reader and Charlie believe this to be the case for the Silver Eyes as well as the Twisted Ones. However, in The Fourth Closet, the third and final book in the novel trilogy, we learn that there is no Sammy Emily. That instead, Charlie was the one who was kidnapped and killed by Afton. And that for all these years, every version of Charlie had been a robot designed by Henry and implanted with fake memories. So, technically, since Sammy Emily isn't real, they aren't a victim. And if we want to get even more meta with it, they were almost a victim because Scott could have decided to let the story stay that way and not make Charlie a robot but he didn't. Sure, Sammy could have been a real character. That, or if Sammy was real, they would have been a victim, meaning that since it didn't happen, they were almost a victim. Like I said, this list was hard, but I promise the next ones make more sense. And it's seven, Fred Trap. Fred Trap is exactly what you'd expect. It's spring trap on a yellow Freddy animatronic, okay? The designs are actually uh, scarier than normal spring trap to me, and I guess maybe it's because bears are scarier than bunnies in general. I think that Scott made William use the spring bonnie suit because of how Scott himself was scared of Bonnie, um, but that's just idle speculation. I also think that originally William was planning on using the Fredbear suit, hence its super powered jaw, but after Crying Child bit the dust, pun intended, he decided to use the bonnie suit instead, since, you know, thanks to Elizabeth, he knew that Crying Child might be possessing Fredbear. Um, but, uh, but he wasn't, okay, and that's also idle speculation, but anyways, it, it's speculation from a DM who tells stories and knows how to story build, so maybe I'm onto something here. But anyway, there are still more rundown versions of like and like also scrap versions of Fred Trap, which are already terrifying. And at six, William Afton again. I say again, even though technically Burn Trap was on the list already, um, but also some may not consider that the same thing. But what, what I mean is, in the context of this number, it makes sense. Okay, could William have suffered a spring lock failure before getting trapped in the spring Bonnie suits, like we see in FNAF 3? Uh, you know what? It's possible, and it explains why I said again. It certainly appears that way in the FNAF novels, because William is described as having scars that are consistent with the Springlock failure before becoming Springtrap in the books. So, could it have happened in the games? I doubt it. The reason we think it could be possible is because we hear of an in incident at a sister location that has multiple and simultaneous Springlock failures, so maybe that could have been William, okay? There are plenty of people that it could have been, but William having to deal with it would definitely get them put out of commission, at least for a time. But then, considering how he kept using the suit, Afterwards, I, I I doubt it because you know, trauma. But again, he's a psychopath. So halfway through, in at number five, Grim Chica, the first Springlock victim in the Final Night series. Grim Chica is a primary antagonist in Final Nights Three: Nightmares Awoken. Unlike the others, she's not a Reaper animatronic, which is a good thing because Jesus Christ, those things are horrifying. Uh, but Grim Chica holds a strong appearance to the Springlock suit posters in the Night Three cutscenes. But her face plates are very hard to spot, and she's almost entirely purple. Purple, you know that, you know purple. The glowing accents inside of her resemble a human corpse because of course it does. She lacks a bib, uh, she's very slim, like Toy Chica, luckily, um, except for the hips, which appear to be much wider because you know she's gotta give birth to those dummy thick Chica babies. 
And it's also revealed that Grim Chica is a springlock in the museum level, saying, quote, a victim of a springlock failure forever forced to haunt the suit she was wearing. I, I don't get it, man. Like, why? Why? Why would you do this to Chica? I put this on the list instead of Gl Grim Freddy because, well, I mean, like, it's Chica, okay? And look what they, look at what they did to my girl. Okay, well look, look at what they, how they massacred my girl Chica. Alright, it's rude. In a fourth shadow animatronics. One of the oldest theories is that the shadow animatronics are the first Springlock victims. And this comes to us after FNAF 3's phone guy dialogue that mentions multiple and simultaneous Springlock failures. Which, some interpreted as multiple Springlock suits failing at once, instead of multiple Springlock mechanisms within one suit. So the line of multiple and simultaneous Springlock failures could mean either multiple of the Springlocks inside one suit failing at the same time, or more than one Springlock suit failing at the same time. This led some to theorize that previous employees were killed in the Springlock suits, which is where the shadow animatronics come from. This is supported by the fact that these are versions of Freddy and Bonnie, the two animatronics who do have Springlock suits, um, but I'm pretty sure this was disproven by Scott at some point, or at least they, he mentioned that it was wrong. Sorry, there are also multiple holes. Uh, with the theory, but anyways, Shadow Animatronics, still pretty cool. Getting close to the end in at number three, us. We as the player in many of these games narrowly avoid death, sometimes with ease, sometimes by the skin of our teeth. Like in the Baby Night Terror level of FNAF VR, where we are literally trapped in a closet that baby could open at any time and kill us. Other times are less close, like if we see an animatronic right outside our window in FNAF 1 and need to quickly close the door before it gets us. But either way, there is no denying that we in every FNAF game are almost victims. Sometimes we even are victims, like in FNAF 4 where we die thanks to William pulling the plug, or in Sister Location where he gets scooped and stuffed with Ennard, or FNAF 6 where we willingly allow ourselves to be freed by the cleansing fire. No matter what, it's undeniable that we are some of the most resilient characters in the whole series. Normal people would see what they're up against and then quit day one, and then when asked about it at their next interview they would say haunted animatronics were trying to kill me, so I quit. Simple as that, no other explanation needed. But we, as the players stick it out for a week and instead of quitting, we get fired because we know what we need to do and that's pretty admirable. And ultimately in at number two, Jeremy Fitzgerald. Jeremy Fitzgerald is the character most assumed suffered the bite of 87, a moment that has been debated since the start of the Five Nights series. While yes, this Jeremy may lose his frontal lobe, he could have lost his life. And I don't know about you, but losing my frontal lobe and getting promoted to day shift and suing that company to get a boatload of money sounds a lot better than death to me. Especially since MatPack concluded that one of the only things that would happen would be your loss of self-preservation and fear. Now I have no idea what an entire frontal lobe being removed would do, but it still sounds better than death. Which in my opinion makes this character almost a victim, since if that animatronic had moved even slightly, or Jeremy had been an inch closer, it would, <laughs> it would have been much, much worse than it was. Oh yeah. Finally, in at number one, Casey. Casey is the main character in a Fast Bear Fright story I don't know if I've really talked about in detail. I might have mentioned the story here and there, but I don't think there's been a whole number on it. Casey appears in the Fazbear Fright story Dance With Me from Step Closer, the fourth Fazbear Frights book. She ends up stealing some glasses that when worn either reveal or display a Ballora animatronic dancing. Honestly, this is the first character I put on this list and the reason I thought this list was possible, since this entire story revolves around how she was almost a victim of Ballora. Now don't get me wrong, the story is very unclear in this regard, but it's generally assumed that the ending does imply that the little girl who gets the glasses back got snatched by Ballora, who spent the entire story slowly getting closer to Cassie every time she put on those glasses. She returns the glasses to the woman who owns them, and when her daughter ends up putting them on, she's the one who starts dancing. And knowing this series, I highly doubt it's because she was excited to see a 7 foot tall Ballora dancing right in front of her. Cassie was very nearly caught by Ballora, instead having a little girl take her place. That kid was probably a brat anyway though. I hope it was brave. In at 10, Spring Trap. Now, this number is really meta, and that's why it's starting off the list. But this isn't a metaphorical or philosophical number as if, like, if you thought it was going to be. Springtrap has literally killed other versions of himself in the Fazbear Fright story of In the Flesh, from the fifth Fazbear Frights book, Bunny Call. After Matt hadn't playtested a VR game he was working on for a few days called Springtrap's Revenge, he came back to find piles of dead spring traps that the AI had somehow spawned in order to have something to kill. It's absolutely horrifying and it's just plain weird. Like why would you spawn more versions of yourself in order to have something to kill? Like isn't that just like a paradox? Like like how you physically are unable to prevent yourself from being born since if you do the you you fade out of existence, but then you can't go back and prevent it. 
So like, you can't you can't stop yourself from being born because then you can't stop yourself from being born. I mean, I, well, depending on what theories about time travel that you believe, whether you believe Back to the Future or Endgame. That also makes it impossible for your younger siblings to prevent you from being born, um, but the older ones can prevent the younger ones because they'd still be alive uh, before you were conceived. So uh, watch out, Jordan. And at nine, Hudson. Hudson is the protagonist of What We Found, the third story in the 8th Fazbear Frights book Gumdrop Angel. Hudson has short blonde hair with a pale beard and blue eyes. He also has straight white teeth. He has bruises and burns all over his body. He's 6'1 and skinny. Almost like me, except my teeth aren't white and I'm not 6'1 and I don't have a beard. But I have blue eyes and I'm skinny. <laughs> Hudson is a security guard at the upcoming horror attraction of Fazbear's Fright. His life up to this point has been filled with nothing but tragedy. His father committed suicide and his mother remarried a man named Lewis who would physically abuse Hudson at nearly every chance he got. He also became the main target for bullies who would hold his head down while flushing a toilet. Hudson began to fail school and instead of trying to help him, the teachers would instead call him names and tell him that he's dumb. Gotta love the public school system, am I right? The story would later reveal that Hudson's family home burned down with Lewis and his mother inside, killing them. While Hudson does burn in an oven at the end of the story, he was in essence driven there by Springtrap, who was the main antagonist of the story. So still a Springtrap victim. By the way, Hudson was also the one who set the fire that killed his mom and Lewis, so. And it ate Jeremy. There aren't many glitch trap victims, so we can't really do one of those lists. But since Jeremy from FNAF VR was driven to suicide by glitch trap, who is William Afton's code form, I think it's close enough to deem a spring trap killing. Jeremy from FNAF VR is the game tester who tested the game before Tape Girl, and is the one who Tape Girl found after he cut off his face using a guillotine paper cutter. This was thanks to William invading Jeremy's mind through the use of the VR game, which is still confusing to me, since like unless you were connected in some form of sword art online haptic suit it shouldn't really be possible we're only seeing the game with our eyes not plugged in like the matrix but I don't know why I'm bothered by it I mean I'm literally talking about a game series where a man possessed by the spirit of a child exploded after somehow communicating while comatose had then used his intense agony to possess a hard drive that then gets scanned to create an AI that allows this man to continue living so I don't know why I'm getting caught up in semantics honestly but yeah Jeremy. And it's seven, Lewis. Lewis was introduced in FNAF AR through emails that he's lucky he's the only one seeing, and not HR. Lewis is a creepy co-worker of Ness who works at IT, at the company creating all the robots for the Fazbear Entertainment Delivery Service that we experience in Special Delivery. And he's probably the creepiest damn character in the entire series. Honestly, I'm surprised he hasn't been killed, especially if Ness is indeed Vanessa and Vanny, since he seems to be on to their little scheme. He's intercepted search queries and emails that just make Ness seem off and straight up like a serial killer. Didn't she order like realistic human masks at some point? Anyway, if William had seen these emails addressed to Ness, he would feel required to take matters into his own hands and get rid of the guy who keeps spying on them. Unless this would be a similar situation to Henry, where the cops would look at these emails and see that he was harassing Ness and then maybe take her in for questioning. I mean, it's a realistic scenario. Ness feels threatened or annoyed by Lewis and then just gets rid of him. People have killed for less. And the contents of those emails is only more incriminating. Like, who orders realistic human faces? Aside from me. <laughs> and at six, Indie Game Dev. The Scott Cawthon in-universe stand-in is an interesting character I hope they explore more in the future. But with Scott retiring, could this character meet a grisly fate? It could be that Fazbear Entertainment wants to tie up loose ends while trying to rebuild their reputation, or that maybe they threatened him into making the games in the first place, so they're keeping a close watch on him. I mean, if William learns about what this guy was making, maybe he would feel like he needs to silence the one man who knows too much, or strong arm him into creating the games after he learned that he knew about the real story behind Fazbear Entertainment. It's entirely possible. It could also be that the indie game dev was the person the FNAF 6 franchise owner job was for, since there was a way out planned for them, and Henry knew at least one other person that knew what was going on. But that person wasn't Michael, as we learned from the final speech, meaning that whoever that was, was almost a victim as well. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. Halfway through in at number 5, William Afton. 
William does eventually kick the bucket, but even when his physical form dies, he comes back as sentient code in a video game, and isn't that the dream? Either way, this man narrowly avoids dying throughout the whole series. This man was possessed by a spirit that intentionally kept him alive through multiple instances that should have killed him, so I think if anything, this guy is the definition of almost victim. William doesn't even ultimately die until he allows himself to in the Fazbear warehouse in the man in room 1280, and even when his body explodes, he's still surviving through latching onto a hard drive that gets scanned into Help Wanted. And I have no doubts that he picked the one that would specifically be used, or one that he instructed someone else to use when making the VR game. At least if the game was planned before his demise. Seriously though, William survived a spring locking, the FNAF 3 fire, the FNAF 6 fire, and the constant assassination attempts from the hospital staff. So this guy is for sure making it onto this list. And at 4, Kelsey. Kelsey, in essence, is the main antagonist to the Fazbear Frights story, the new kid from the third Fazbear Frights book, 1.35am. Kelsey had just moved to town and ends up making friends with the protagonist, Devin. Devin ends up getting jealous of how much everyone loves Kelsey, so he hatches a plan with his friend to trap him in a springlock suit for a few hours. However, when they unleash their plan, the springlock suit fails and kills Kelsey. At least, so they thought. Since a week later, Devin returns to make sure Kelsey is still there, only to find a different body in the suit. He knows it's someone else because the hair color's different. And then Devin gets stuck in the suit by his arm and bleeds out. Only for the story to cut back to Kelsey meeting two more kids at his new new school. This is an interesting story, because while Kelsey did get springlocked, he ends up being fine. So what happened? Some think that Kelsey's a ghost, some think that he's the one you should not have killed, others don't know. But either way, this version of Kelsey, the one who got into the suit, was nearly a victim that somehow survived or escaped. At least, so we think. Getting close to the end and in number 3, Gregory. Now with Security Breach not releasing until late 2021, we can only speculate as to what happens to our next main character and our player Gregory in the next Fazbear game. However, it's entirely possible that Gregory ends up getting killed. Think about it. This is literally a kid who is fighting one of the FNAF universe's deadliest child serial killers, who has multiple animatronics out to find him and control over a security guard. Not only that, but it's entirely possible that Glamrock Freddy ends up betraying us and crushing us while we're inside of him. That sounded weird. It's not like we haven't been killed in the games before, or at least horribly mutilated like we were in Sister Location. And we as the player die in FNAF 6 along with Henry. So Scott is not new to killing off the main player in his games. But also, realistically, he's a kid. And like, what's he gonna be able to do against a literal sentient code? And if he lives, there will be someone to tell the cops what happened. And if William was paying them off, he certainly wasn't anymore, so maybe they can have an actual investigation this time. But only if Gregory lives, so he's, he's probably gonna die. And ultimately in at number two, Michael Afton. Now this may be confusing to some of you since Michael doesn't die until FNAF 6, but come on, this guy is the biggest Springtrap victim of them all. Let's just recap what happens to Springtrap's own son for God's sake. He kills his brother, assuming that's actually what happened. He then learns about his father's killing spree and tries to right his wrongs. While doing so, he is haunted by the spirits of the children his father has killed. And then learns about how his sister has possessed an animatronic after getting scooped so many years ago. Then he learns that he is probably a robot and gets ripped open by a scooping machine. After this, a giant robot amalgamation of parts fills his body and lets him bruise and rot while wearing him like a suit after Barney Stinson had a mental breakdown. And then he vomits that entire animatronic back out. Can you imagine how painful that would be? The seven foot tall mass that is entered coming out of your throat. But somehow, he's still alive. Then he finds a job posting about a new Fazbear location and applies for it, but then has to salvage animatronics that include the thing that ruined his body, his long dead sister, one of his father's earliest victims, and his father, all of which may kill him if he's not on high alert. This man has suffered probably the most in the entire series. That's absolutely horrifying. And at 10, Elizabeth Afton. Elizabeth is at the top of this list because, well, she got killed, but she also doesn't really seem to deserve it until after she gets 
killed, and then she deserves the spring locking. Which, I mean, in a way makes sense, and it's something that I've been using as evidence when it comes to who I think the vengeful spirit is. Because, you know, spirits, when they're, uh, you know, being spirits for longer periods of time, would understandably start to go crazy, or even crazier. And this is an idea that Supernatural, the, the show, has used in length. And the same idea, though, could be applying to Elizabeth and Crying Child. Just because you start off good or loving your father doesn't mean that you'll continue to see things that way in a few years' time. And Elizabeth, while not deserving a spring locking in 1983 when she dies, definitely deserves one come sister location in FNAF 6. I mean, she literally betrays her brother and sister location, nearly killing him, and then, again, she also betrayed him, and then in FNAF 6, she wants to make her father proud. Her murderous, psychopathic father. She wants to make him proud. Considering how you've been possessing an animatronic um, that he made that caused you uh, to die, that he made, I think that you would have already made him pretty proud, I guess. It's a damn shame that you turned into this, but whatever. In at 9, Mr. Hippo. Okay, this is kind of a joke number, but also not, because Mr. Hippo is literally the worst thing ever in Ultimate Custom Night. Mr. Hippo is a viable animatronic from FNAF 6 that returns as an antagonist in Ultimate Custom Night. Okay, Mr. Hippo will climb through the duck systems trying to reach one of the two hoses in the office. Hoses? Is that right? I don't know. I just copied and pasted that line from the wiki. The player needs to use an audio lure to keep him in place and to move him around so that they can use the heater to push him back, and he is he is fooled 100% of the time by the audio lure. Also, is fooled faster than Helpy Frog. However, most of the scare factor from this animatronic doesn't come from their behavior or their design. This time around, rather, their death lines. Because you see, Mr. Hippo has a knack for going on about things. A lot. Okay, it's like me on a first date. Still, he will go into like five minute long speeches that you have to deal with every time he kills you. Meaning that if you get jump scared, you're boned for enough time to make a sandwich, okay? Which is annoying as hell. Getting killed by him enough will eventually and cause you to end up agreeing with me that he needs to be spring locked. Because you end up knowing what comes after the smoke of the jump scare clears and it's just pain. In at 8, Roxy. Okay, I know that Roxy and Mr. Hippo are animatronics and incapable of actually feeling pain because of a spring locking, but honestly, I also just hate this kind of person. This The self-centered tool bag who only cares about themselves, whether they secretly hate themselves or not, that's not what matters here, okay? Who you are and what kind of person you are is defined by how you treat others and who you are when the pressure is on. And Roxy is just horrible. And while they may not be able to feel pain, from the spring locking, at least Roxy will be contained if they got spring locked, okay? And honestly, that's what I need. I don't want to deal with this personality type. I've dealt with enough people like this throughout my life, and I'm still only 22 goddamn years old, which means that I'm really fed up with this shit. So yeah, there's, there's not much else to say with this one other than I want her to be restrained so that I don't have to deal with her. Uh, so yeah, that's it. That's the number. What are you still doing here? Go to the next one. And it's six, Charlie. Okay, so in a way, Charlie in the Twisted Ones novel is a victim of Springtrap. And by in a way, I'm gonna have to suspend my disbelief because she was still a robot. While the original Charlie was killed by William Afton, in the Twisted Ones, one of the four robotic versions of Charlie gets snatched by a twisted animatronic and gets killed. Which only makes things more confusing when another version of Charlie, who is much older, shows up. But that's not the point. The point is that at this point, William had become Springtrap, and the twisted animatronics were his invention. So while yes, she was a robot, she was still a sentient robot who got snatched by an Afton creation after he had become Springtrap, so that's good enough for me. This was, like I said, actually harder than I thought it was going to be. William doesn't do much killing after becoming Springtrap, because he's locked in a room for 30 years. Most of the damage was already done at that point, so please forgive a few leaps in logic or suspension of disbelief, please. Thank you. Halfway through into number five, Matthew. Remember how earlier I talked about how Springtrap was killing himself in the Springtrap's Revenge VR game in the Fazbear Frights book Bunny Call? Well, not only does he do that, but he also tears the main character Matthew to shreds. Now, some do consider this Matthew to be a reference to MatPat of Game Theory, and it makes sense why. But what makes this bad is that the community considers this an M-Preg fan fiction, which I have to say, I enjoyed not knowing what that was until I had to ask my sister about it because it was everywhere online. 
she's really into fan fiction, it's kind of concerning. Anyway, basically Matthew in this story gets implanted with a baby spring trap thanks to a program called it's a boy.exe, which literally ends up tearing him to shreds from the inside out. Hardly a fun experience, I would say. Yet some women go their whole lives wanting to give birth and have kids. But I mean, at least most of the time, they don't kill you from the inside out. Or, or rather, they don't usually claw at you and dig through your stomach. That's exclusive to Springtrap. I hope. Getting close to the end in number three, Gregory. The way I see it, Gregory is such a stuck up little shit that he would absolutely deserve to be crushed by metal robotic bits being put in the same place as his bones. Because this kid is just a damn menace that seemingly doesn't want to take responsibility for any of his actions. And you know what? None of you hold him accountable either. Gregory orders the robots to disassemble Vanny. Uh, quote, okay? Gregory being willing to kill Vanny is already pretty messed up, but while some would argue self-defense, this is not self-defense. Self-defense requires a reasonable amount of force to be used, okay? Tearing a person limb from limb is not reasonable force. This kid is easily able to destroy all three animatronics without a moment's hesitation and then use their upgrades on Freddy. He is willing to kill Vanny, like I said, despite actually seemingly knowing her like we see in the best ending. And then he burns Burn Trap multiple times in an attempt to stop him from taking control over Freddy. Um, but again, he's also just setting fire to this thing all the time. So like, what the absolute living hell is this kid doing? And how is he so nonchalant about this whole thing? Okay, this guy literally kills Vanny and then only gets emotional when he has to go talk to a destroyed Freddy robot that they can remake. Dude, Vanny is literally bleeding out right next to you. I'm sure that her, her ribs are just splayed across the floor. Dude, couldn't you have just said like stop Vanny or restrain Vanny? Stop Vanny would have been the easiest one, not freaking disassemble. Okay, you're not panicking about literally anything else in this game. Okay, just, just say something that doesn't involve a human dying for God's sakes, okay? Stop Vanny! Like, dude! In a 10, Devin. The story, The New Kid from 135 AM, the third Fast Bear Frights book, revolves around Devin, Mick, and Kelsey. Devin and Mick are outcasts from their class, and they aren't really popular. You know, they aren't cool. But when the new kid Kelsey arrives, uh, they try to make a new friend, despite Kelsey being incredibly charismatic and adored by everyone in the school. Over time, Devin grows jealous of Kelsey, since, you know, he has everything that he wants. So, in an act of revenge, or in an effort to gain control, uh, Devin hatches a plan to lure him to an abandoned Freddy Fazbear's and trap him in a springlock suit for a couple hours. To try and maybe, like, humble him, I guess? I don't know what the plan was here, but the plan, whatever it ended up being, goes incredibly wrong. After getting in the springlock suit, it fails, as expected, because, you know, it's a FNAF book, causing blood to soak into the fur of the animatronic, and, you know, you know what happens when a springlock fails. So, yeah. Uh, Devin and Mick leave Kelsey for dead so they won't get in trouble, uh, but something doesn't feel right. So a week later, Devin returns to the scene of the crime like the idiot that he is, sticks his hand in the animatronic's mouth to try to find a body, and snap. The spring locks fail yet again because for some reason someone reset them, and as per usual, Devin gets his hand stuck inside the machine and bleeds out, but not before seeing uh, black hair in the suit. Uh, instead of blonde hair. Would you want to be springlocked? Uh, hopefully you said no, but whatever you answered, the opposite will happen unless you like this video, okay? You got five seconds. Five. Four. Thank you, thank you. See, there you go. Now you will either be spared or not, depending on your life choices, and uh, probably previous trauma. Let's keep going. In at nine, you. Spoiler alert for a fan game, but if I say which fan game, uh, it will spoil it. So if you want to avoid spoilers, skip to the next number, okay? I'll give you a chance to do that. All right, now that you've prepared for the spoilers, A Shadow Over Freddy's is a FNAF fan game created by Fiznom on Game Jolt. It was released on the 25th of April, 2018, and it was made by the same guy who's currently working on FNAF Plus, so you know it's going to going to be good. The gameplay of A Shadow Over Freddy's is a hybrid between a traditional point and click and a free roaming horror game. So you just, you, you click and it's flat. The player ends up waking up to find themselves with no memories in a Freddy Fazbear's pizza and is tasked with surviving the five nights. The player is given different tasks and then you have to complete them before 6am and then getting out of the establishment. However, the ending of the game has you getting trapped in a springlock suit and being left to rot, meaning that you're a springlock victim and I don't like that. So yeah, number, number nine. In a date burn trap. Well, yes, 
technically Burn Trap themselves isn't a Springlock victim, it's the most recent form of our main antagonist, and you know what, I want to hate on him real quick. Like, what is this man's problem? What is with this full-on Harvey Dent knockoff and is somehow still living ass and trying to take control of Freddy, okay? Like, what does that even do for him? Sure, he can, he can use Freddy to get to us, but this man is also just at the end of the hall, okay? He can just crawl through the vent like Monty does, and then you'd be able to get to us. Even if we, like, close the vent, we can't have it closed forever. That's why there's a power bar next to it. So why couldn't you just wait it out and then tear Gregory to shreds yourself, you pansy? Come on, stop having your minions do everything for you. Where, where's the William Afton that everyone was scared of, huh? Like, that little spring locking made you that much of a little b like, come on, dude. Hey, you're a grown man, and I'm the size of a four-year-old. Why are you so scared? Because, like, because of the robot that's running on low power after glitching out? He should be on bed rest, not trying to help a kid, okay? He can't even take on multiple staff bots. Have your minions take Freddy and then deal with me yourself, okay? You say you always come back, but apparently, every time you do, it's as just that little bit more of a pussy, okay? Burn trap? More like just... Burn. In at six, FNAF cops. The cops in the FNAF universe are absolutely the most moronic bunch of people I have ever, I guess, not seen, but heard of, honestly. Like, yeah, I get that they couldn't catch William for story purposes, but that seemingly was retconned, since in the first game they said that they had made an arrest. They could have ended it right there. The story could have been over, but they couldn't find the body, so they let him go. Yeah, ignore the animatronics that smell like death, are leaking blood and other bodily fluids, and that many parents have compared to reanimated corpses. Those don't have anything to do with this scenario. Yeah, totally. And even when they find baby's blueprints and see that she has a child storage tank, they don't do anything more than question him. Quote, there's no doubting what you've achieved on a technical level. These are clearly state of the art. There are just certain design choices that were made for these robots that we don't fully understand. We were hoping that you could shed some light on those. Dude, arrest him! <laughs> and search the bloody, rotten body smelling animatronics. God damn it, how hard is this? Okay, if it's a crime scene or a suspected crime scene, you, you, come on, if it's a crime scene, you don't ha need to have a warrant, for fuck's sakes, okay? They all deserve spring lockings for the sheer stupidity alone. I'm surprised that they didn't crawl into one and then get killed by it just because they're that damn stupid. Arrgh! Getting close to the end in number three, Garvey. A psychopathic, cold-blooded killer. He stopped being human long, long ago. That's how Garvey is described in the extras for Domitibus, okay? The game from which he is the penultimate antagonist of. As a human, he was the man who killed the missing children and then later went on uh, to get trapped in Spring Bonnie, becoming Springtrap, and then was burned to a permanent death in the Fazbear Fright's fire, which is where the two timelines start to separate. Garvey is a more gory version of Springtrap from FNAF 3, obviously. However, it's not actually William Afton, since the game was released before the name reveal, and even before FNAF 4. Springtrap, but with hardly any exosuit or animatronic casing, whatever you want to freaking call it. He crawls on all fours and uses his left hand as a foot and his left foot as a hand, like some demon spider monkey from the deepest pits of hell that Satan didn't sanction the creation of. Like, Jesus Christ, I don't understand how this thing wants to operate, but honest, I, I don't want to know, okay? This creation is a monstrosity that haunts my nightmares, and it, it's... Haunting my nightmares even more so than all my actual real-world trauma combined, so I don't know, okay? Maybe Garvey's just there more because it's just, like, at this point, my mental health has gotten to the point where he's basically a visual representation of my damage. But either way, it's terrifying. And finally, in a number one, The Twisted Ones. The Twisted Ones novel starts a year after The Silver Eyes ended with Charlie in university. However, one day, Clay Burke comes to see Charlie and for some reason brings her to see a corpse with familiar wounds. This could be either because she would recognize them, or because she was working with the police, or because they just had to advance the plot. I don't know. I haven't read the original novels, and at this point, I don't really want to. However, looking at the wounds, she can confirm that they are in fact from a Springlock failure, despite some not having any actual experience with forensics. But that means that we do have an unnamed Springlock victim in the Twisted Ones novel. And if this character does have a name, please let me know in the comments because I can't find one online. However, um, I also had to kind of rush to get this list, so maybe I didn't look enough. Who knows? It might have been William, it might not have been, I don't know. And there was also fake blood, and it real they realized that Afton faked everything so that he couldn't be 
kill, caught as a serial killer. It, I don't know, okay? It, 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 it's stupid. William needs to die. Stop bringing him back. This is like a, a show like Criminal Minds, bringing a character, like bringing a serial killer back after giving him a lethal injection for the fourth time. Okay, I don't get it. Stop doing it.